I remember it was shortly after that was the first time that he kissed me. And we got back from um, teen soul winning on a Wednesday. And he's like, hey, Rach, um, can you come to my office really fast? I, I need to talk to you about something. And I'm like, okay. And we walk in there and he says, uh, you know my sister-in-law, Kathy, right? I said, yes. And uh, she was not very like super involved with the church at that point, but her and my mom were really good friends. And I actually babysat some for Kathy. So I, I was around her a lot and I knew who she was. And he said, do you know why she's the black sheep of the family? And I said, no. And he said, because when she was a teenager, she had an affair with someone that worked at the church here. And she stabbed him in the back and went and told everybody. Hmm. And I'm sitting there shocked. <laughs> and I said, no, I didn't know that. And I said, what happened? And he was not telling me this as like a, in a thing, like scary way. He had a way of like, it was like, it was the newest gossip that he yeah. just found out. Like, right. guess what I just heard. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like what happened? Right. And he says, um, yeah, she went and told everybody. And I mean, totally screwed up his life. And he and his family had to leave the church and go somewhere else and just stay here. And she got in a ton of trouble. Mm. And I'm just, I, I know now exactly what he was doing. And I mean, even with his very choice words of, you know, calling it an affair and saying right. she got in trouble for stabbing him in the back. And all of those were, I mean, those were very specific words that he used. Right. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like I had no idea. And he says, well, that's why, you know, you just need to be careful, you know, about what you say and who you say it to. And I'm like, oh, mm. okay. And he's like, anyways, I, you know, I just want to tell you that, you know, have a good night. And so I walk out and I'm instantly like, well, I'm not going to say anything. Like, you think I want that to happen to me, <laughs> that I'm going to get in all this trouble and people are going to call it an affair. And, you know, mm -hmm. I don't even know what's going on right now. <laughs> and so after that is when, after he told me that and had that conversation with me, and I remember I even asked, like, does Pastor Goddard know? And... He said something like, well, yeah, how do you think, who do you think told him to leave the church or something like that? So in my mind, I'm like, so this has already happened before and nothing happened. Right. He just left the church and Kathy got in trouble and which, that left me. Sa which sadly is like, true. But, that, yeah. That's a hundred percent true. Yeah. And I mean, at that time, I did not feel comfortable enough or I, I didn't want to say anything. And especially, I didn't want to go to Kathy and say, is it true you did this? I mean, I, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and I, I walked out of there and I mean, that seed was immediately planted in my head. Like, yeah, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not even going to uh, keep a word about this because I don't want people saying that about me. <laughs> Right. And I mean, from there, the, the abuse just like ramped up. I mean, there was never a time that I was around him that it was not happening. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what started as something like little things added up very quickly. I mean, it started as just like, you know, slapping my butt or grabbing my boobs or putting his hand on my skirt or, you know, really anything that you can think of. I think people have a hard time believing that because, you know, we were most of the time at church and um, that entire property was essentially a crime scene. I mean, 
it was either in the hallway or in a nursery or in a bathroom or in his office or in a classroom or in the chapel. I mean, there was, there was no room that was off limits to him. And I mean, all of these little things very quickly um, just led to full blown rape <laughs> um, for a long time. And I mean, I'm even telling me that he knows which rooms on the church property don't have windows. And so it could be very easy and quick to be in those rooms. <laughs> and I mean, and it was not just limited to church property. It was at his house. It was at my house. It was at teen camp, at summer camp, at winter camp, at teen activities, at youth conference. I mean, at senior trip, there was never a time that it wasn't happening mm. ever. <laughs> and I mean, this is all going on while he is also preaching in church <laughs> and preaching in youth group every Sunday and preaching in chapel and, you know, speaking about purity and pledging your purity and how you should date with your boyfriend and girlfriend and, I mean, all of this is going on while 30 minutes before that, he sexually assaulted me in his office. Like, how does one even process that? Uh, yeah. How do, how do you, I mean, obviously now, like, I mean, there's no way to process it, but I mean, at the time, I mean, obviously there's a long grooming process, but like when you're sitting in a service and you have that in your mind and he's saying something completely contrary to what you know is actually happening what's going through your mind in church service are you disgusted are you just do you not even notice it because the grooming has been so like what's going through your mind in that church service when you're seeing you know presumably people going to the altar and making commitments for purity or going and you know saying amen to things he's saying like how do you reconcile those two things i feel like at that time i was completely tuned out i I could be there physically, but mentally I was gone. <laughs> and I remember I, I made a comment to him one time about like, how can you, you know, how can you preach about purity? Like, don't you think that's a little hypocritical or, you know, and he also was a very, and I don't think a lot of people saw this side of him, but he had a very like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of personality where one minute he could be telling me, you know, oh my gosh, you're so pretty. Like, you're so cool. You're my best friend. You know, he literally told me he wanted to marry me. And then if I say something that he did not agree with, or if it was not the reaction he wanted, it just flipped like in a second. And it was, oh, so you think you're better than me now? Or who are you to judge? Look what you just did. And I mean, yeah. at that time, he was already, while all this abuse was going on, I, I was made to feel like I was making this happen, or I was allowing this to happen. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he would tell me, you know, I, I had to spend extra time with God this morning because of the thoughts you put in my head. And I'm just sitting there like, okay, what do you want me to do with that? Like, I'm sorry. I don't know what I did. And I mean, when you warp God and the Bible to a very vulnerable and impressionable person that is just trying so hard to make God happy. And then here I saw an outlet to try to do that. And it was turned into a very sick man's sexual desires. No. I don't know what God is. I'm just trying to please him. And I know I'm failing at it because this is not what right. I had in mind. And I mean, he would even go as far as, you know, using Bible verses to either convince me to do things or to make me feel bad about saying no. Example, the verse Proverbs 13, 12, which is hope deferred, make the heart sick. And 
me not me saying no or me not wanting something to happen is making him sick. Hmm. And the Bible talks about, and the, the verse continues on with like, but um, something the is a tree of life or something like that. And so it was like, well, why, why don't you just do this? Because the Bible says that I'll feel like this, or it was a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And so you're not feeling my desires. Hmm. So that we can, and it's like, well, I guess if that's what the Bible says, <laughs> I yeah. mean, and that sounds inane and ridiculous and so sick now, but as a 15, 16, 17 year old kid, you're so desperate to follow the Bible yeah. and to follow what God is saying. And not just that, but I mean, so much emphasis is put on the man of God and that there is no questioning the man of God. And so to be sitting there, even though what happened 30 minutes prior, but then sitting there in church, listening to him. I mean, I've already been so confused at that point that it's just like, I guess this is just what's happening. I guess this right. is just what's supposed to happen. I'm not happy about it, but at this point, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> there, there is in my mind, there was no way out of that situation. <laughs> yeah. No, and it, you know, like you said, it sounds insane, but it honestly, the crazy thing is it doesn't sound that insane when you're thinking about it in the context of this culture. Like, and it doesn't, when you're thinking about pleasing the man of God, like when you're thinking about, you know, what do they have to say about what the Bible says, you know, it's obviously not everybody in that movement uses that to this, you know, kind of advantage or as this kind of leverage, but yeah, it's not it doesn't sound insane. And that's where I, I always go back to. It's not, again, do I condemn the entire movement? You know, I know there are good churches, but you have to look at the, the way that men are propped up within this world opens the door to an incredible amount of abuse if the wrong person gets into those positions. And so, yeah, it Absolutely. does, it does sound insane. It's insane that we give guys this much power in churches over, our kids over our spouses over ourselves um so yeah i think for people listening who maybe don't have this exact experience i think they can relate to that idea of feeling like well i don't like what i have to do but i have to do it because that's going to make them happy that's not a well that's not yes, a rarity extremely because i mean even i remember um in our camp book like each year we went to camp you got like a handbook that had the rules in it there was a rule in the book that said the adult is always right, even when they are wrong. Mm. And if, I mean, that's a rule that you're being yeah. taught that you, you don't even question the adult, even if you know they're wrong, they're still right. Yeah. And if you were to say anything about any leadership, um, you were instantly kind of made a sermon illustration by Goddard. It was, there, there's no, whatever the authority says goes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that was drilled into our heads, even as young as kids, you yeah. don't, you do not question. You just simply obey and you go along with it. Right. And that can breed a victor, which yeah. is so dangerous. And you, if you take an environment where the authority is never to be questioned ever, and then you put so much pressure on the girls, especially, I mean, starting as young as sixth, seventh grade for how they're supposed to dress and how they're supposed to look. And you're doing that because the men and the boys cannot help themselves. And it is your responsibility to help them. So then if anything were to happen, you automatically feel guilty because it should have been your job in the first place to prevent that from happening. And then you also add in where there's so much emphasis on purity, mm -hmm. but that means the only talk of sex that is happening is linked to purity, which means if no, if you're not talking about sex, that means there is absolutely no conversation about consent. <laughs> and yeah. so you take all that and now hire a sexual predator to work there for 20 years. What did yeah. you think was going to happen? It was, right. it was always set up for a recipe for disaster. And unfortunately, 
we were the ones that suffered because of it. Yeah, no, it's it's inevitable, and and that's that's a conversation I've had with a lot of people that I I truly do care about in that world who work on staff at these churches. Is this was even in my conversation with Stacy Shiflet? You know, it's the. I understand that you're against abuse. I understand that you're saying that you don't want this to happen. And I, okay, I'll take that. I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. But don't you realize that the next person who takes your position in the pulpit has the platform to do exactly the thing that you're talking about? Mm-hmm. And most people don't want to think about that. You know, I, no. I, I look at my, my, um, the school where my dad works and I constantly say, that. I'm like, do you notice that this weak spot is inevitably going to eventually, if it's not even in your lifetime, the platform built here is going to lead to a harmful result down the road. But it is in, and I get it. We don't want to think about that because who wants to think that the next youth pastor is going to be a victor, but you have to think like that. You you can't, you can't afford not to think like that because most of the reaction, well, most of the time that we deal with these cases is reactionary there's very little thought into how do we prevent this from happening. But um, so, so obviously you've got all this pressure you've got, you know, now you're so deep into this where, I mean, I can't imagine like I'm sick to my stomach listening to the clear now, like ways that he was just intentionally groomy. Like this was step by step, but like, I can't imagine the thoughts you're having as a, you know, 16, 17 year old thinking now I have all these secrets. So it's not just the one thing it's, it's like, it's the music it's, it's going out together by ourselves. It's, he told me about this past story. Like at this point, it's like, you guys are, you know, you're his accomplice, like you're his accomplice in your mind. You're Mm -hmm. like, we're partners in this. And the minute that I do something to expose him, it's going to expose me. And like you said, in a purity culture, it's going to be, oh, am I impure now? Are people not going to let me, you know, go to the school anymore? Is this going to affect my family? So what was kind of your, what was going through your mind during the end of this? And what was it where you, you know, got to the tipping point where you were like, okay, this has to stop. Like this, this needs to end. So I, I mean, this. This was all going on even, I mean, my senior year, even on senior trip, Mm. I mean, this was all, this was constantly going on up until graduation. And I graduated from high school and I saw as the only escape from what was going on was to just leave. And I saw college just as my escape. I can just go to college and I'm not going to live here anymore. I'm not going to be here anymore. And I don't have to worry about it. And I obviously had that fear in the back of my head that what if he does this to somebody else? Yeah. But I was also being made to feel like I was the one that started this. Right. I was the one. I was the one to blame. So it won't happen again because I initiated this. Yes. And so if I'm gone, then it will just stop. I looked at going to Hiles Anderson was an escape for me, which is kind of funny to think about, but it was, I mean, I was thousands of miles away. I, we were not speaking anymore. Um, It was like, it didn't happen. And that's how I handled trauma. As a lot of people handle trauma, it's like your body and your brain convinces yourself like, okay, it's done. We don't need to think about it anymore. And I didn't, I mean, it would creep up in, you know, nightmares and things like that. But with being in a new environment, in a new city, um, you're not reminded by things every single day. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm dating now, I'm making new friends. It, it was mentally put on the shelf and I was not about to deal with it at all. <laughs> right. Uh, how, how difficult was it transitioning to like dating and, and just going about normal college life. Cause you've got now this, you know, years of secrets that you have and things that have, I mean, deeply molded who you are at that point and are inseparable from you, at least at that point of life. And so how was it trying to shift into like, 
you almost got pushed into early adulthood and then now I have to go back to like, okay, now I'm just a new college student and have to like make my way through this situation. Like how difficult was adjusting to college? Um, I mean, I, this was definitely not a normal college experience right. as this was Bible college. Um, and Hiles just, Anderson of all it's places. Hiles Anderson, right. which is just uh, another extension of um, Faith Baptist um, on a much bigger level now. Right. Um, one of my first relationships there was a very abusive one. And I'm, I'm able to see now that I thought that was normal because that's all I knew. Yeah. <laughs> and as sadly, that happens a lot. Um, I mean, I, I did struggle with dating a lot. And I've also at that time had a lot of self-hatred towards myself and convincing myself that I don't deserve a good guy. I don't deserve anything good because look at what I just made this man of God do. Mm -hmm. Um, And it, it was definitely an adjustment and it was very hard. I was also, I went to college in the fall of 2010, um, which was two uh-huh. years yeah. <laughs> before everything happened with Jack Scott. For Chicago area, mega church pastor is being called a sinner tonight, dismissed from his church. And CBS2 is learning more about why. His name is Dr. Jack Scott of the First Baptist Church in Hammond. The staunch Baptist preacher and married father is accused of inappropriate conduct with a younger member of his church. CBS2's Brad Edwards live in Hammond with the late developments. Brad. Good evening, Kate and Jim. The charismatic leader led his church to 15,000, ousted for a relationship that now has authorities investigating which is everyone wondering. From the pulpit. Hey, oh, you listen to me right now. I still believe it'd be a cold day in hell before I get my theology from a woman. I'm a preacher. I, I wasn't mama called, papa sent. The seemingly pious man preached until the bow broke. His first Baptist, the biggest thing in Hammond, a main auditorium, a secondary, Spanish speaking, a mega Sunday school, a parking ramp. It even owns the former federal courthouse, its headquarters. The sheriff told CBS2 via phone, quote, two high ranking individuals came to my office early this morning. We have initiated an investigation. We asked if it was sexual in nature. The sheriff said, quote, yes, that's the nature. To the conglomerate church's college, Hiles Anderson, named after his father-in-law. We're told the young woman in question, a student here, and that the reverend confessed to his sins to the church's governing body of deacons when confronted to his home, where we went. At the door, we were greeted with a no comment. So many of you got nervous. Saw the preacher on the news. Praise the Lord, the word of God is being quoted. Very charismatic. You know, like he was a magnetic person. He, you know, gathered you in, you know, like Jesus would. Decades long parishioner Norma Hogan, aghast by the news of the man who baptized her. This is really jaw dropping. We are told details will be laid out to the entire congregation tomorrow, right here at 7 p.m. As for the investigation, it's just getting underway. Authorities were only put away, made aware of this this morning. Reporting live in Hammond, Indiana, Brad Edwards, CBS2. Jim and Kate, back to you. All right, Brad, thank you very much. And that was just like a giant trigger <laughs> the yeah. entire time. I mean, that. That event, I, I can under, I can realize now, um, really put a lot of fear and anxiety in me. That was the first time, to my knowledge, that I had heard of another pastor doing that, <laughs> and seeing it on such a big scale like that. Um, and especially seeing the reaction from people and the way that um, his survivor was talked about um, terrified me. Yeah. How, and, how was she talked about? I'm always curious. I've talked to a few people that were there during the Scott time, and I'm always 
because I know I've had supporters of Scop on my YouTube channel, like that are like, just let him out and let him preach. Like I've had those comments. Um, what was the reaction on the campus and in the church services during that time? Was it primarily slanted against his victim or was it a mix? Like what was kind of the reaction there? Um, well, I, I feel like my college experience was so kind of interesting because I did experience it two years with SCOP and then two years after. <laughs> and, um, I mean, when all that went down, it was in the summer. So I was not in, on campus. I was living in California at the oh, time. Um, but I remember my friends and, I mean, roommates and people I went to college with, everyone immediately changed their profile picture to um, a picture with Jack Scott. Wow. And, I mean, I hate to even admit that there was a part of me that was like, is it true? I mean, I think that's everyone's kind of first reaction. This was the first time that I had ever heard of anything like this. Mm -hmm. And the more and more I heard, the more details that came out, it was realizing like, oh, he's getting in trouble for the same exact thing that just happened the entire time I was in high school. And that terrified me. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I hate to say this just in case I, any of her family um, were to listen to it, but I, I remember people calling her a whore and, um, you know, saying that she ruined this man's ministry mm. and um, it, that, that was really hard <laughs> to hear. And um, I came back, that all happened, um, that had to be end of July. And we came back to school the next month in August. And leading up to that, I remember I really, I was really struggling. And I actually remember Bruce Goddard called me to ask how I was doing as Mm. he was kind of keeping up with all the college students that were going to be going back um, just because it was a very intense, crazy time. And I said, I'm really struggling with this. Um, I, I don't know what to think. I don't know how to process this. And the first thing out of his mouth is, well, don't think about that. Think about all the good that brother Scott has done and look at the amazing ministry that he built and this and that. And I, I immediately was like, I don't want to think about that. Like these are very awful things that he is being accused of. Like, why are we going to, be praising his ministry right now. And he made a comment about like, you know, and I think we should just sit back and watch. We don't even know if this is true yet. Mm. And I mean, his whole reaction, I just remember thinking like, okay, so I'm never going to say anything about your youth pastor (laughs) because if this is your reaction, if this is your advice to people is, uh, well, just remember all the good and we don't even know if it's true yet. And we should be, you know, praying for this and that and no mention of, you know, the girl at all. And that, that was really hard to hear. And so when we came back to school, um, I I think just the, I think the staff as well, were just as much in shock too, and just kind of figuring out what to do. Um, I did notice there was a lot of emphasis on forgiveness that right. semester, um, which was very hard to hear. Uh, I remember there was a guest preacher. I don't even remember his name. Um, he had no business speaking though. And he got up in chapel and said, we need to forgive Jack Scott and we need to, you know, be praying for him yeah. and hoping for the best. And I, I mean, I, I felt like I was about to have an anxiety attack. I'm like, why are we even mentioning his name? Like this man is about to go to jail for sexual assault. Why are we pushing to forgive him so quickly? Right. And that, I mean, very triggering (laughs) semester. And was that, just sorry, I, I don't want to keep interrupting you, but I, I'm just curious. Was there any inkling about Scott before the news broke? 
because Scop was also, and now that I'm looking at both personalities, like Scop also had a reputation for telling off color jokes and being very I mean, R rated from the pulpit. Yes. He was extremely um, blunt with many things. ABC News called me this week and said, uh, we heard that you um, believe that men should be in charge of their wives. I says, no, sir. No, sir. I didn't say that. I said, God said that. He said, husbands are the head of the wife. I said, if you got a problem with what I said, I was quoting the Bible. Maybe I'll take it up with God. He says, do you, do you think that's appropriate? I said, son, I says, anything God says is appropriate, and you better get that straight right now. I never apologize for standing where God stands. I never worry standing where God stands. Somebody says, you know what they're going to say about you? Who cares? Stand in line, pick a number, slob. Get your little squirt gun out and squirt away. Bigger things to worry about. Heaven, hell, life, death. The Bible, what people say about you, not at all. If they're quoting me while I'm quoting the Bible, hallelujah, God's word is getting out. Don't you ever worry about your pastor being rattled or worried or unsettled or unnerved. I sleep fine. Interesting enough, he actually came to our youth conference um, at Faith in Wildemar wow. in June. Um, I think that was one of his last, second to last speaking engagements before, mm. you know, everything came out. And that entire sermon was about purity, which is... Yeah very strange to think back on that he was preaching a sermon on purity while committing sexual assault with yeah. Victor sitting on the platform. I mean, that's yeah. a lot to unpack. And I mean, he, he was so, so blunt with talking about sex and talking about, you know, um, how often just a lot of opinions. Of, yeah. From well, him I mean, women, women need to keep their figure to keep their men yes. happy. You know, he, I think he, at least it was rumored that he used the F word in one occasion from the pulpit, like in, and said, if you're using a word, use the right way. Um, you know, but then there were all these pastors, like, I mean, Jim Benny, you know, preached and said, you know, after all this happened, said, oh, I knew something was off with Scott, but I never said anything. When I came here, over a year ago, when I moved here over a year ago, I immediately knew in my spirit that something was wrong. But I made a covenant with the Lord and myself. I mean, I, 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 I remember one time I corrected Pastor Scop on, on a sermon. Uh, it was uh, a quiet reception, not unkind. But I, I, I began to think, you know, I'm the new kid on the block. I, I don't have any right to, to go to Pastor Scott. If I, if I hear something that I think is a little off base biblically, if I, if I sense something that's wrong, I am going to earn the right, I said to myself, uh, by waiting one year before I say anything. You know, that year was just up. And I have to wonder... If I'd been a Nathan. And I have to wonder, why didn't I say anything? Why didn't you? Why didn't the staff? And, and, and I'm not saying they didn't say anything. But, but did any of us know to do good and not do it? Did, did, or, or were we afraid of the king? Were we afraid of what he would say or how he would respond? Were we afraid of losing our job and our salary? Did we fail to speak up because, my friend, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And sometimes we need to be wounded. It was just so, the amount of stuff and it, with Victor, with, that just got swept under the rug, with Scott especially, got swept under and people ignoring all of these gut instincts about it. It's just it's just wild to me. So anyway, I was just curious about whether or not there was a an inkling or or like a you know sense that oh Scop is kind of pushing the envelope where other people haven't. Right. Well, you also have to keep in mind at that time he was a celebrity. Right. He was a god in many people's eyes. And 
there, it, there was no, you might've felt uncomfortable. You might've thought that something was off, but you weren't about to say anything. It's not your place. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I, I saw his, I only saw his ministry firsthand for those two years, but I mean, that man had bodyguards. He had the newest cars. He had the newest suits. He was the man. There was no, yeah. who, who are you to even question anything? Right. compared to who he is. So d- do I I do I blame people for not speaking up in that situation with Scott specifically? It's hard because I know how it was there. I know what yeah. the atmosphere was with him and well, how and he, he groomed was so an entire church. <laughs> he did. He right. really did and was also I mean he could be just as mean as well and very verbally abusive to people, but right. you're not about to say anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. He was so, he's one of those ones where you look back and you're like, it makes sense. Like we, when you listen yeah. to his sermons, you listen to the way he talked about women in general, the way he talked about teenagers in general. I mean, and Jack Hiles did the same. Like there's clips of Jack Hiles where he's, you know, he's telling an, I think an eight year old girl that she's like very touchable and like, you know, Jack Scott, uh, you know, if you listen to the last sermon that Jack Scott ever preached, like it's the most Freudian, yes. like the fact that he said things and I'll put in a clip here, but some of the things he said that he just openly said with no hesitation was so shocking. And it really, it really is. It's, it's crazy to me just how they ease into these roles where they can really do whatever they want. Sexuality is taught in this book. God created it and most of us think it was a great idea when I say that to teenagers they go so do I I said you know who made that God did do you know why Uh -uh. let me tell you when I sit on the eve of a wedding and I tell the couple can I say a few things about what you're going to get involved with I tell them, I tell you what it really is all about symbolically. And they say, we never heard that before. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. That's why we lose our kids. Because sexuality, listen to me, that sexuality change, that adolescence, is the most crucial moment to connect a child with the God who gave them that beautiful Wonderful change to become an adult. And we disconnect and we pull the plug instead of plugging it in. So after the Scott thing happens, you're getting ready to go back to college. What's what's the return like <laughs> back to, to Hiles Anderson at this point? I mean, it was um I had a really good group of friends and we really depended on each other during that time. Um I felt like the staff was just kind of, I don't know if absent is the word, but they had bigger problems than us. And so um, the whole, what I found very difficult though, was we weren't allowed to talk about it. And that was hard because it was so hard to act like it's not happening right? when we all know it is. And you know, if anyone were to hear us talking about it in the hallway or with each other, it was like, guys, come on, we don't need to be talking about that. And it's like, but I feel like we do. (laughs) Like, there was always slight mentions to it, you know, pray for our ministry. Um, We're in a battle. And this is what Satan wants. And the typical, you know, go to rhetoric, I feel like, but it was never fully addressed in my opinion and the only like public announcement was when he went to prison and that was um, when gibbs came up and did the the talk about it i was not there when gibbs did it that was right after it happened um but when he went to prison um this was not in the church this was at the college okay and the president came down and wanted to announce it before we heard it on the news that he was sentenced to prison. And I mean, I'm, if I remember correctly, he did ask that no one record what he's going to say. Um, Which means there's definitely a recording of it somewhere. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure there is. And I'm kicking well, myself that it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> but um, who, who was the president at that time? Was it Ray Young or was it 
um, was it Wendell um, Evans? It was, no, the president at that time was Stuart Mason. Stuart Mason. Okay. Um, um, yes. And he's no longer um, involved in that ministry anymore. But um, I remember he came in and he made an announcement that he, Jack Scott would be going to prison for 12 years. I remember people instantly crying and it was just a really weird, we were all in the gym. It was kind of very informal, but um, I do remember him saying that, you know, he preferred no one record this. Uh, I remember his little speech was very lawyer-ish, very protected of what he was saying. Um, that just like this happened, you know, we're okay. We're in this together. The end. And I was, I, I think I was more shocked that he actually went to prison because I know at that time there was a lot of like unknown as to what would happen. And I remember I, they started instantly, if I remember correctly, just started singing a song mm -hmm. and like praying about it. And I didn't feel comfortable being in there. I walked out and I went and sat in my car and I started crying because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this yeah. guy just went to prison for the same exact thing that happened my whole high school experience. And this was the first I had seen yeah. that happen. And I think that scared me even more <laughs> to never want to say something because I mean, at that time, Bruce Goddard was still a very respected pastor at Hiles Anderson. Our, our church was sending the most students outside of First Baptist. We had the most students going there. And look at what all they just had to go through with this mess. And do you think I want to bring that on my church? Do you think I want to hear people talk about me the way I heard them talk about her? And mm. I, I was terrified <laughs> and I just like got myself together and went back in the gym and sat with my friends and act like everything was fine and just went on with my day. And that's so important. That's the way that churches handle these situations sends a huge flare up in the sky of either it's safe to come forward and we're here for you or we're on the side of the abuser every single time. And, you know, the way that first Baptist of Hammond handled this situation um, and the way that people in the church handled this situation and the way that faith Baptist of Wildemar has handled multiple situations now. Um, I, well, I say multiple, I could say multiple for both. Um, there's been all of these beacons shot way up into the sky saying, we do not care. Like, do not yes. come forward. You're going to get thrown under the bus. And, you know, it's it's so important. And that's where I just, I mean, I just look at these churches and I'm just like, you have to make a, a very concentrated effort to establish yourself as a place that is safe and legitimately safe for people to come forward. Because who knows? Like, the sad thing is, just statistically, like not even just talking IFB, there were probably a lot of Rachel's that day sitting in their car because of a similar situation. And it's, mm -hmm. it's honestly scary to think about how many were probably seeing oh, that service is. with the same Absolutely. thoughts and bringing the IFB into it at Hiles Anderson, probably a shocking amount of people. Yes. And so I just, again, if you're listening to this and you're a pastor or you're, if you're anybody, if you, if you ever come across those cases, like the way you react is not just important for the victim, which in the case of Scott, you know, for, it doesn't it doesn't seem like there was much care given to her whatsoever. At that time, there just because I'm, I I knew and I was friends with a lot of the staff members at that time, and I know that it was just as much of a shock to them yeah. and a survival mode for so many of them. Um, what I I see now, and especially through the eyes of a survivor, there was no prayer for her. Mm -hmm. It was all for him and his family. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray for his family. I'm not at all saying that. Right. But he, in my eyes, he was kind of instantly made the victim in the situation. Right. 
to pray for and to feel bad for. And there was never a pray for the victim and her family. That never happened. Right. It, as much as I can remember, maybe I'm wrong, but right. my entire experience there and all the church services I sat in and all the college chapel sermons I sat in when anything was bleeped, it was all about praying for the scop and the family and especially the church. Right. It and we see this time and all, again. Right. Yes. It was not at all for her or her family who are also going through an extremely traumatic event that they will never recover from. Right. And that was, it was like, they didn't even exist in the situation. All that was being talked about was him. And I, I do wish, I mean, I know all of us could go back and wish we could fix situations, but I, I, I hope for the future that that is thought about yeah. that. Yes. I know that his family is hurting and they're just as surprised too in figuring this out and the church is hurting but there's also another person that is yeah. really hurting. And I don't think that church is still hurting. There's still a lot of people there. So I think they're fine, yeah. but not her, not her family. Yeah. And they were just completely forgotten about in the situation, in my opinion. And I, I, I think that they could have done better about that. And she deserved a lot better than that. Um, you know, we talked about, there's probably a lot of people who had these same experiences and, you know, we have to be very careful the message we send to survivors. And obviously the message sent to you by Hiles Anderson and by Wildemar was keep quiet. Um, and you essentially did through your college experience. You you left college, you get married, um, which the fact that you walked away with a Daniel Peach and not <laughs> not what you could have walked out of Hiles Anderson with is a positive yeah. thing. Um, so what was it? It was around 25 when you, when you actually came forward, what was it that changed? You, you know, you, you bought the lie to stay silent for so long. You were, you were being manipulated so heavily for so long. What was the point where you said, it's time to share my story. It's time to expose what happened. And what did that process kind of look like for you? Um, this is a tough question because um, it was not on my timeline. Hmm. I was not, at, at that point in my life, I was completely fine with never saying anything and just kind of letting it die. And it wasn't until I was at work one day and I get a phone call from a friend and I could tell right away that something was wrong. And they just said, you need to call. And I know she wouldn't mind me saying her name, which is why I'm going to say it. But they said, you need to call April Heck mm -hmm. right now. And I said, okay. Um, and at that point, um, April is a lot older than me. She's seven or eight years older than me. So we grew up together at faith, but we were in very different stages of life while growing up just because she was a lot older than me. Mm -hmm. So I was like a kid when she was in the youth group and stuff like that. But I knew who she was and um, I was friends with her brother and um, we, we live in the same area now and we actually started having um, like play dates and stuff um, with my nanny kids and her kids. So we kind of got reconnected. And so it wasn't like crazy that she would be wanting to talk to me. I just saw her like two weeks ago and I said, okay, is everything fine? And she said, she just told me that she was molested by your youth pastor. Mm. And it was like, oh my gosh, like it was all being brought right back to the surface. And I was like, why does she want to talk to me? Like I was instantly kind of scared. And she said, well, she doesn't know who else to talk to you. And you're the only one here, like from faith. So I was like, okay, that makes sense. So and I, I was more scared, like, oh my gosh, does she know about me? And I go to her house and I'm instantly, I mean, as soon as I got off the phone, I, I immediately went and threw up. I was so scared. I was so, I mean, I haven't thought about these things in the last, you know, five, eight years or so. And, I mean, and you're, you're already married at this time, right? At this Did, point, we've been married for 
three, four years. And did he know this? No. Okay. okay. I I mean, when I mentally put it on the shelf, you put it, it on the shelf. There. Yeah. I I never talked about it with anybody, <laughs> and I was instantly like, oh my gosh, like. I, I mean, there was that relief that I was not the only one, but that was immediately followed up with fear of, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. <laughs> this was never supposed to be dealt with. And so I go to her house and I mean, we were both very visibly upset and she just starts talking to me and tells me about what she went through. And it was like, I, I could feel my hands shaking. I had to squeeze my hands so she wouldn't see them shaking because it's like everything she was saying is what I lived as she's like on the buses, in the closet, in his office, at his house. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like she's seven years older than me. This went on way before I even stepped foot in yeah. the youth group. And she looked at me and said, did anything ever happen with you? And I, I just, I will never forget the look in her eye. And I looked at her and said, no. Mm. And I was not about, I, I'm like, okay, I, I just brought this back to the surface. I, I'm not about to deal with this. And I, I said no. And I could, I knew she was so hurt. Like, she thought she was going to find someone else to help her. And I'm just like, you know, I'll help any way I can, but no, like nothing happened. And I, I mean, I look back and I'm like, how could I sit there and lie to her? But I, I just, you, you can't unsay that once it's out there, you can't take that back. Like that, that's never coming back. And so I, I was not about to deal with this. And so she, I, I mean, she said, well, I'm just really concerned because um, I don't know what to do. Like, she was very lost. And I said, well, why? She said, because I already went to Bruce Goddard about it. Wow. And I said, oh, I was relieved. Like, oh, okay, he knows. She said, yeah, I mean, I, I told my dad. And at that time, her dad was the chairman of the deacon board. Mm -hmm. which was like a very respected position in the church. And she said, and so my dad immediately went to Bruce Goddard and told him in detail about being molested by Victor. And I said, okay, you know, waiting for the, the follow-up. Yeah. And she said that conversation happened almost six months ago. Wow. And I, I was furious <laughs> And I said, what's, and what happened? And she said, nothing. He never said anything. He never called me. Um, and I don't see anyone talking about it. So I don't, I don't think he told anyone. And she said, I'm, I'm just kind of stuck. I don't know what to do. And so she asked me if I would be, she wanted his family to know but she was too scared to be the one to tell them. And she's like, I'm pretty sure they don't know. I don't mm. think Goddard has told them or has said anything. And I said, I saw that as my opportunity to help, but not get that involved. And so I said, I, I can tell them if you want. And she said, yes, I, I would really like that. And so I did. And mm. I made a phone call and told them. And at, at this point, I'm still like, you know, I'm going to help, but I'm not going to get involved. I'm, I'm just going to pretend like nothing happened with me. And then it was the next day. Um, or maybe the day after that, it was right around, uh, right after that though. Um, I get a text from Victor and he says, I'm not stupid. I know it was so-and-so that told you about me and everyone's going to know about you. And the name that he told me was not April's name. It was mm. a different girl, uh, a girl actually much younger than me. 
And so I instantly put the pieces together that this happened before and after me. And he actually is really stupid for texting me that. (laughs) And I, I think I needed to know that because it made me realize how serious the situation was that this is a very evil man and had very serious problems. And when it was brought to the person that should have done something about it, um, he's not doing anything. (laughs) And I immediately told April um, because at that point, um, April did not know if she was going to get the police involved. All she just wanted to know, she just wanted it out there. And she just wanted to make sure that he was not working in a church anymore. And we did not know if he was. And so that's when I told April, I think you need to call the police. This is very serious. And because in my head, I know that's three victims now. That's April, me, and this other girl. Right. And she said, yeah, I, I think I am. So she did. And it was shortly after that, that she called the police and our big fear and her big fear, which is why she wanted to go to Goddard in the first place was because of her statute of limitations. Because at that Mm -hmm. time it had been almost 15 years since her abuse from Victor and with the California statute of limitations, she kind of knew that they were going to be like, sorry, can't do anything. But if she found someone else to go with her, it would be a more solid case. And that means maybe they'll take it a little bit more seriously instead of just an accusation with no proof from 15 years ago. And that's all she was looking for. And so I said, well, I now know, you know, we know of another girl. If she'll talk, we don't know. But we have at least some kind of evidence and proof showing that, you know, he's essentially admitting (laughs) that something happened with her. And of course our biggest fear happened and she went to the police and they basically said that, that, sorry, this is too old. We can't do anything. And so now I'm sitting here like he is about to get away with it because everyone is completely failing her. Bruce Goddard completely failed her. The police aren't taking it seriously right now and he's going to get away with it. And it, I mean, it tore me up because I'm looking at it as, Rachel, you can do something about it. You're just Mm -hmm. too scared to. And so that was when I finally decided, okay, I'll speak up. And at first I'm like, I'm just, I'll just tell the police. I won't tell anybody else. And it's funny. I even, in my first conversation with our detective, I said, you know, can you be careful when you're calling me? Cause I'm not, I'm not telling anyone like, this is all a big secret that I'm going to be involved. And it's just funny to think that now I'm talking about it on a podcast, <laughs> but, um, that, I mean, that was why I spoke up. I, I cannot sit here and take credit and say like, Oh, I just realized one day that I need to do something about it. No, I, I was totally fine with just letting it die. It wasn't until somebody else had the bravery to speak up and that's where I got mine from. Yeah. Uh, So uh, what, once you were able to actually speak up, what was the, how did you go about that? And and I'm curious for this one, because it's part of your story, but I'm also curious for those who perhaps are holding on to secrets like this and are struggling. Like, who do I tell? Do I go to just the police first? Do I tell my parent? Like, what was that process of kind of sharing your story for the first time? And what was the response you got when kind of explaining what had happened? So the very first person that I told was our detective. Okay. And um, I guess in my head, and I've, I've had so many people ask me like, how, how did you not, how are you not able to tell your husband before that? And I feel like it's easy because I knew that he would be crushed and I wasn't, I was not ready to see that. I had so much, I felt like going on in my head that I did feel more comfortable talking to a police officer who I'd never met. Right. And there's no relationship there. There's nothing. I'm not scared of his reaction. Right. And there's, that that's why I I felt like it was it was easier to do that. Um, yeah. 
And so when I did, I just like finally made the decision, like, like you need to do this. And I called him and the, it's so funny because even I look back on how I worded things because I mean, even at 25, I still did not recognize it as sexual assault and saying something like, you know, then he touched me and it was followed up with, you know, so when he molested you and it was like, he didn't molest me. Like you're realizing like, even as an adult, like, Oh, I guess by definition, that's what he did. (laughs) Or, you know, a rape survivor. It took me a long time to say what happened was rape because I did not want to call it that. No. And, but that's, that's what it was. And I told, I talked to the police and the next day I was actually supposed to be leaving, um, on vacation. And I kind of saw it as like, what I'm doing right now is business. I can't let emotion get into it because I'm going to get all thrown off. I was not, I was not letting my heart get into it yet. It was just business. I had a job to do now. And especially because the police did tell me that because I did not have evidence, they were wanting me um, to do what they call a pretext phone call where I was supposed to call Victor Hmm. and try to get him to admit. And I needed, I felt like I needed to stay focused about that. If I start getting emotional about this, I'm not going to be able to do it. And I, I stayed in business mind. So I went probably almost two weeks after talking to the police and I didn't tell one person that I had just talked to the police Hmm. and it, in my head though, I mean, I don't regret doing that because I, I got the job done. (laughs) I did what I needed to do. And if I would have, you know, told my husband, told my mom, told my friends, then I would have had all these people so concerned and worried about me. And my personality is also like, I I need to help them. I don't want them to be worried. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that. I didn't want any distractions. And so after I talked to the police, I still went another two weeks or so until I told, you know, my husband and my family. Right. So, um, you know, you mentioned obviously the phone call and we talked, that was one of the biggest things that shocked me when we first initially connected um, was, I mean, essentially like that phone call um, because there was a, there was the way that he, basically incriminate himself in the statement that he said really just kind of shocked me. Um, so can you talk about making that call and, you know, basically getting essentially the piece of evidence that ended up getting him actually arrested and things to actually move forward? So the first time that our detective talked to me about making the phone call, he's like, would you be comfortable with talking to him? I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that. And he explained it, you know, that, well, in, cases where there's no evidence, um, this is how it works, that you would just call him and the phone call is recorded and just get him to talk. And that's your evidence. Mm -hmm. And the more I thought of it, I'm like, you know what? And and like, he said something like, well, you know him more than I do. What can get him to talk? And the more I thought about it, I'm like, you're right. Like, this is our only window of opportunity. If it doesn't happen, it's done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he gave me, he was, I mean, the most incredible person that could have ever been assigned to my case. And he gave me like this really good pep talk, you know, like this is your time to get your power back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he manipulated you. Now it's your turn to manipulate him. And, you know, really boost me up that like, I could totally do this. And so I spent the whole day just thinking about like, if I say this, maybe he'll say this. Or if he tries to say this, I'll say this. And all I wanted, I mean, I wrote down exactly what I wanted him to say. I wanted him to acknowledge what happened with me, to acknowledge my age when it happened, and to see if he would talk about any other girls and his involvement with Goddard, if he would say anything about him or the church. And so I text Victor really late at night. And I said, I'm the only one that knows anything going on right now. 
it's either now or never. Can we talk? Uh, because I knew <laughs> that he was not going to ignore that. And he didn't. And he called me like in the next hour or so. And I immediately ran out to my car because I needed to have something recording us. And I set up my iPad on the dash and I put it on speaker and I just said, Hey, I'm driving so that he wouldn't question why he's on speaker. And, you know, he immediately went on this big rant, like, Oh, everybody hates me now. And everyone's spreading lies about me. And, you know, I heard that you're spreading lies about me and I just let him rant. And, um, my detective really prepped me that if, if I'm not going to come on here and attack him, I'm not going to come on here and yell at him because he's just going to hang up. And so I immediately played, like, I feel so sorry for you. I'm so sorry that your life is falling apart and that people are saying these awful things about you. And I finally said, you know, I'm just really hurt because you told me that I was the only one. And now it sounds like I'm not. And he was like, what are you talking about? And I said, was I the only one? And he said, of course you were. And right then I knew, like, I got you. And was I the only one? Yeah. I was the only one that you had sex with. Yeah. I mean, he said it clear as day. I mean, you're the only one I had sex with. And I'm like, I just can't remember how old I was because with statute of limitations, maybe I'm out of the statute of limitations and they won't worry about it. What year was that? How old was I? He was like, what, were you like ninth or 10th grade? <laughs> and I mean, right then I'm just like, I can't believe this is actually happening. Like this is working. Yeah. And um, he went on and he accidentally kind of admitted to things of April, which they were able to use to charge for her case. Um, he made a comment about, I tried to go to preacher and, you know, preacher can't do anything. Yeah. And I mean, I wish that I would have asked him about that, but it was like in his little raging fits where he's just complaining about everything. And I mean, but I, I sit there and think like, what, what did you try to go to preacher about? Like, what did you try to talk to him about that? He said he can't do anything no. as, as we're sitting here talking about all the girls that you have hurt. And so I, I mean, I knew right away that I, I got the evidence that we were definitely meeting and I just let him stay on the phone and talk for just random stuff. And that's what they told me to do was that any, I had no idea what he could be saying, but the police might be able to use it as evidence. And that's what happened with April's situation is in just a comment he didn't even mean to say is what got him with April. Mm -hmm. And um, so the next morning I sent it over to our detective and I mean, right away, he's like, we got a case. And so I think from there, I felt a lot more comfortable telling my husband and telling my mom and stuff like that, because it's like, when I told Dan, I'm like, you know, it was a lot to take in, but it was followed with, but I think it's going to work out. Yeah. I actually think justice might happen now because of this. So you're not being filled with this terrible story. You're also given hope in it. Yeah. It's a, uh, that says a lot about your personality and it's almost, um, I mean, not the situation, but it's almost funny. Like you, you almost try to, like tackle it yourself so that way when you did tell people they wouldn't have to worry about it. And that's an interesting, that's a very interesting personality trait to have of here's the most difficult period of life ever. And I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, you know, totally take care of it all. And then be like, by the way, I've got this all taken care of, but this is what happened. Um, it's just a really interesting, it's a big window into you. Um, but yeah, so from that point on, I mean, obviously we don't have to go through like all the nuts and bolts of everything, but, but I'm curious, like what happened? Was he arrested pretty much immediately after that? Like, you know, so that how all happened. Um, that was in June. So that was like the beginning right. of June. But also uh, when I was on the phone with him, I mean, he would have never suspected 
that mm. I was in communication with the police. I, and I said something like, you know, in case they track phone records, like, I don't want to see, I don't want them to see that we were talking, like totally made him believe that I'm on his side, which is exactly what I wanted him to think. And so that's why I was also, I did not, I told Dan and I told my mom, other than that, I really told nobody else um, that I had to come forward because I didn't want it getting back to him because I knew that if he found out I was talking to the police, he wouldn't know how screwed he is. And I don't know what he would would do at that point. Yeah. What was your, um, but I haven't asked this yet, but w- was your mom still attending the church at the time? And no. okay. No. But, at that she, point they had been gone for maybe four or five years. Was it over disagreements or did she already notice there was some weird stuff or was it something where like, were you nervous to tell her in the sense like, Oh, will she be on the side of the church? Like, was it like that or not really? No, absolutely not at all. Um, I mean, it was more just, I, I knew she'd be sad. I mean, the yeah. same reason that I didn't tell my husband, I knew they'd be sad. And I, I don't like to see people I love sad. And I also like, I, I felt very uncomfortable with people feeling bad for me. And I didn't, I didn't want them to just look at me like I was this, I, I had a really hard time with being called a victim. <laughs> um, I remember even with my detective, I, I, I think I even asked him, like, I, don't call me that. Like, I don't, I feel very weird being called a victim and even by definition that's what I was Mm -hmm. I that was just not my personality I didn't like feeling like that and so I did not want to tell people that I loved because I didn't want to see their reaction because I knew they'd be sad but I I didn't want to see them sad and I mean my my mom was extremely supportive Mm -hmm. and you know anything you're going to do I 100% support and I I expect no other reaction from her which how every parent should react right right so um obviously you know this whole case has not been fully set I mean Victor ended up obviously going and he's serving time oh yeah Uh, I forgot I didn't even answer your question (laughs) he was arrested um July 27th, so the end of July. And that was the longest two months of my entire life yeah. because you're just sitting there, you know, it's coming and you know, when it happens, it's going to get very, very ugly. And, uh, just sitting there waiting. And finally, um, I mean, after I came forward, there was another girl that was also working with the police that also did a pretext phone call where he also <laughs> admitted things to her as well so the, the i mean our case was you couldn't get it more was stacked. Right. yeah <laughs> yes right and so that that's when the end of july he was finally arrested right what was the um what was the response of like the people around you in the were, were you living in california still at the time or no, no? I was not. okay no. so do you know what the reaction was at the church over this um it's hard to say. I mean, I was not there, so I'm not gonna, I'm not going to act like I was. But um, I feel like this is where it gets really hairy because um, Goddard was informed that April was going to the police, and the very next Sunday is when he suddenly had an urge to tell the church about what was going on mm. instead of telling them six months earlier when he was first informed. Right. Um, he felt like he needed to tell the church now that he knew April was going to the police. And um, that was where, I, yes, people were shocked um, of what was going on. We were more frustrated that he essentially lied, that he said he found just found this out. Uh, when he didn't, he found it out six months earlier. And I mean, I, I can't help but think if, if April would not have come to me and I would not have pushed her to do those things, um, he would have been completely content with just acting like that conversation never happened. And right. that is so wrong. <laughs> and and you can't mind, help but wonder how many of those conversations he had. Exactly. Yeah. If he could just so easily brush that out of his head that his youth pastor molested his chairman of the deacon's board's daughter when she was 13 years old and that 
just completely escaped his mind until he found out that she was going to the police six months later. And then he remembered every detail. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.